Good morning on this wonderful Wednesday, November the 4th of 2020, the day after the election. And as my husband said first thing this morning, the sun came up. All is well in the kingdom of God. All is well. God is still God. Nothing surprises our Father. <laughs> Oh, and we get to read Ezekiel chapter 10 and 11. <clears throat> when you take a little bit of time and do a little bit of research, you just learn all kinds of things as well. I, uh, for some reason, don't I don't know that I can really tell you why. Uh, I've been doing this for a while, but every time something about a vision is said or the glory of God is said, I highlight it, and then, um, good morning, and then um, then when you go back and you see those words highlighted, just try it sometime. Just, just try it some up. Um, but, I mean, we're really, really, really getting to see the inner works of our Father. Hebrews talks about it with the word enlightenment. We're going to talk about that here in a minute, but I don't want to go past Ezekiel right now. Of course, we're seeing a vision, and the vision is God showing Ezekiel. He takes him to the east gate, the south gate, the north gate, takes him inside the temple to various locations throughout the temple, and he is showing him how the glory of the Lord has left the temple. Um, but today, there, there was just a couple of things I wanted to point out. Make sure I'm not missing something else. Um, yeah, before I go to this next topic, let's go to um, Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 16. Therefore, tell the exiles. So, so God picks up Ezekiel and takes him to the temple, walks him through the various parts of the temple, tells him that the glory of God has left the temple. And then in today's reading, he puts him back in Babylon, back into exile, but he's telling him things to go and tell his people that who are in exile in Babylon. Therefore, tell the exiles, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Although I have scattered you in the countries of the world, I will be a sanctuary to you during your time of exile. Hmm. Now, isn't it interesting that that is our scripture the day after the elections in America? Not making a political statement. I am reiterating the comfort I get from reading God's word on a daily basis. I will be a sanctuary to you even during your exile. Don't know what your exile looks like. You don't know what my exile looks like. But we all experience it at some point in time in our life, sometimes multiple times. But God is our sanctuary during our exile. What is your exile? And then take your eyes off of the exile and understand and clearly know and keep your eyes on God who is our sanctuary. And then I just wanted to tell you what I researched about uh, chapter 10 in Ezekiel, verse 14. Each of the four cherubim had four faces. The first was the face of an ox. The second was a human face. The third was the face of a lion, and the fourth was the face of an eagle. And as I did some research on that, the first thing that I found in several different places is that the ox represents the disciple Mark, uh, Matthew. The second, um, the human face represents Mark. <clears throat> the face of a lion uh, represents Luke. And then the face of an eagle uh, represents the face of John. I just found that interesting. Um, that's not really the point I wanted to make, but I just wanted to 
I, you know, I'm all the time telling you how God's able to show me in today's scriptures how it applies to my life today. And sometimes that's a stretch for people. They'll go, how did you get that out of that? And so I just wanted to share with you <clears throat> the symbolism that if you do your own research, you're going to run across Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John being, being depicted as the ox, the human face, the face of a lion, and the face of an eagle. But this is what it spoke to me. The ox represented, represented the service. So what is it that uh, I say? We pray, we listen, we read, we serve. The ox represents service. Um, the human face represents intelligence. We have the mind of Christ. The lion represents strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. He didn't give us a spirit of timidity and fear, and but of a strong mind. And, and then the face of the eagle represents heavenliness or uh, heavenliness, but it also represents a mystery. But heavenliness was one of the words. There were several words used to describe it. But So let that speak to you uh, where you're at. Go back over it. Read it again. I want to get to the Hebrews. Oh, my goodness, the Hebrews. So I, I've mentioned to you how God has shown me that the temple represents so many things. <clears throat> the outer courtyard, that there was a time in my life when God showed me that the outer courtyard represented some of our denominations who basically just preach salvation. That first encounter of, oh, look what Jesus did for me. Look what, look what I get to walk in. I, the encounter, the... Uh, but today's reading uses the word enlightenment, and it's really a better word than even encounter, although there's a purpose for both of those. Uh, the encounter results in the enlightenment. Enlightenment. The enlightenment of... See, <clears throat> I didn't just wake up one day and bam, God did something and I'm saved. No, the salvation has already taken place, but I'm enlightened to what Jesus Christ did, and by faith I accept what he did. I do have a part in that, and it is through faith, Ephesians 3 will tell you, that it's through our faith that we're saved. Um, and so then God showed me that then there's the inner courtyard, it's the, the, or the inner room. Today's reading will call the inner room the holy place, and then the most holy place. Other translations sometimes will call it the holy of holies. Um, and, and, and it's referred to in today's reading and that spiritually something happens different in each one of those as we enter into him. It's, it's Christ in us, we're in Christ, the oneness as we enter into him, as we abide in him, we move from the outer courtyard into the into the holy place and something else spiritually happens to us in the holy place and then we get taken to the most holy place the holy of holies and there's even something different there and as we continue our journey when we don't give up when we absolutely never ever ever give up and we continue on the journey from the outer courtyard where we're enlightened to what jesus christ has done for us what god almighty did he sent his only begotten son that whosoever should perish whoever that whosoever should believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life our salvation experience then then he he loves us and we abide with him and, and he feeds us his word and he speaks to us and he loves us as a, as a mother nurses a, a child and moves us into the, to the holy place. And there we have a whole different experience, encounters with him that enlighten us even more. And then 
the Holy of Holies, the most holy place. And with that as a backdrop, I want to just go over the book of Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 through 20 today. So let us stop going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again. The basic teachings about Christ again and again. He's telling us in today's reading, it's time to grow up. It's time to move past just the salvation experience. See, if, if the only purpose in Jesus Christ's coming was our salvation, then he would have whisked us all away from heaven the moment we acknowledged who he is and what he's done for us. But that's not the only purpose. It, and, and it's not our only purpose here on earth. God doesn't want not one la uh, loss, not one. The shepherd will leave the 99 to go after the one. If you are not convinced about your salvation, then I want you to contact me. Send me a private message on Facebook. Uh, put a message in YouTube and let me know how I can contact you. If you are not convinced of your salvation that God sent his son to die for, then please contact me. And then listen in. Listen in as he's telling us there's more. <clears throat> Let us go on instead and become mature in our understanding. Surely we don't need to start again with the fundamental importance of repenting from evil deeds. We don't have to start all over again and just repent and placing our faith in God. You don't need further instructions about baptism, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And so God willing, we will move forward to further understanding. For it is impossible to bring back to repentance those who were once enlightened. See, it's the reason why Hmm, how do I want to say this? There was a time and a place for me to attend a church that that preaches the salvation experience. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. There was a time and a place, and there was a time and a place when I served in those services as well. I loved them. I loved them. But what he's explaining to us is that there comes a point in time when you encounter him and you continue to abide in him and as you continue to abide in him the encounters become more frequent and and readily available and because see the the oneness is is that we should always be in an encounter with him but we do live in this physical flesh that brings us back and we do have to live in this world. We're just not of this world. And so we, when we move to that next level, that, that the, the holy place, and we are enlightened in a brand new way, say through the infilling of the uh, Spirit of God, the, the experience of the spiritual gifts, the encounter with those in, uh, uh, spiritual gifts, then we cannot be satisfied to just go back just to repentance. We, we want more. We, we want more, and we know there's more. I mean, there's more, and there's more, and there's more in him. And so it is impossible to bring back to repentance those who were once enlightened, those who have experienced the good things of heaven and shared in the Holy Spirit who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the power of the age to come, who has tasted the goodness of God. Oh my goodness, I still say the greatest miracle there is is, is the salvation of this sinner here, of this, my salvation is the greatest miracle ever. I will forever be grateful, but, the, but to taste the goodness of God when I am curled up on my, recliner at one o'clock in the morning because a phone call had come and one of my children is in extreme danger and they're two states away and I can't get to them and there's nothing I can do as a mama and I cry out to God and his spirit rises up in me and speaks words to me of comfort that to this day 
when my children are in a struggle, I recall the words spoken to me that day. That was an enlightenment that I experienced that has changed me forever. And I can't just go back to just the repentance. Repentance is everything. It that, that moment of knowing that we're his, that he paid the price, that we've been bought with a price is, is priceless. <laughs> but so are these tasting the goodness of God and, and to have him become your sanctuary at a time when you don't know what the future is going to hold for your own child, that umbilical cord connection with your own child, and you don't know what's going to happen. Oh, well, wow. taste the goodness of God. <clears throat> and then who then turn away from God. It's impossible to bring such people back to repentance by rejecting the Son of God. They themselves are nailing him to the cross once again and holding him up to public shame. I could, there's so much I could say about that, but that's not what I want to focus on today. When the when the ground soaks up the falling rain and bears a good crop for the farmer, it has God's blessings. But if a field bears thorns and thistles, it is useless. The farmer will soon condemn the field and burn it. See, that's why it's so important that we read. It's why the Old Testament's important to us. The Old Testament defines, quote, sin to us. Not because we have to worry about sin anymore under the New Covenant. It's because of the fruit that we are to bear. And, and, it, and it defines it and it makes it so vivid that if I do this, that is contrary to God's heart. But if I live this way, that is God's heart. And, and, and then the fruit we bear, it, but if a field bears thorns and thistles, if what my life is is bearing fruit of is thorns and thistles. You see, I know you're getting it. <laughs> Dear friends, even though we are talking this way, we really don't believe it applies to you. We are confident. Now, this is, this is um, the writer. Uh, we are confident that you're meant for better things that come with, uh, things that come with salvation. Better things that come with salvation, better things than even salvation. Can you imagine? <laughs> if you've experienced it, if you've tasted the goodness of God, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And if you have not, he is enlightening you with his words today to tell you to continue to seek him. Seek ye first the kingdom and all, all these things will be added unto you. For God is, is not unjust. He will not forget how hard you've worked for him and how you have shown your love to him by caring for other believers as you still do. Our great desire is that you will keep on loving others as long as life lasts. And now get this. <laughs> get this. Keep on loving others in order to make certain that what you hope for will come true. If you're longing for the sweet taste of that enlightenment with him, it begins with love. It begins with love. See, I attended those churches that preach salvation and I praise God every single day for them. And then I served in those churches um, because I love. She who's been forgiven much loveth much. Out of love we serve. Out of love we serve. And then it's out of love that we experience what he's describing in here. More than repentance. A hope for more. To taste the goodness of, of the word of God and the power. And the power of his laying hands on somebody and they're healed the power that lives on the inside of you to experience it. It comes from a place of love inside of us. That's why I will tell you over and over and over again, every single problem I've ever had in my life stemmed from the inability to believe that God loves me or to allow him to love me. Sitting in my recliner that morning at one o'clock a.m. after that phone call, knowing I was helpless, 
the doubt part of it was, does God love me enough to help me with my children? And then when I opened my heart and made myself vulnerable, I could hear him speak and tell me, Elizabeth, I'll take care of your boys. I heard that voice. I'll never forget that. To this day, that is an encounter that recreated an enlightenment in me that will never go away. Never go away. I'm so thankful. Our great desire is that you will keep on loving others as long as life lasts. As long as life lasts, it all begins with love, it all ends with love. In order to make certain that what you hope for will come true, then you will not become spiritually dull and indifferent. Oh, then you will not become spiritually dull and indifferent. What makes you spiritually dull and indifferent? We could break that down first starting with the love our inability to comprehend how much God loves us or even to believe that he loves us, our inability to love others. And he, in this book, will tell us who to love. We love the unlovable. How easy is it for us to love those that are lovable? No, our, our reward comes when we love the unlovable. We love the ex-wife or husband. We love the stepchildren. We love the enemy. We love those who are wanting to get us fired at work. We love those who are bullying our children. We love the unlovable. Love. Then you will not become spiritually dull and indifferent. But why did he tell us to keep on loving others? It, we're to keep on loving them. <laughs> we, 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 we can't love them without serving. It all works together. What? Why, why do I feel like I'm not hearing God's voice anymore? Why have, why have I become spiritually dull and indifferent? Instead, you will follow the example of those who are going to inherit God's promises because of their faith and endurance. Verse 15, then Abraham uh, waited patiently and he received what God had promised. Then Abraham waited patiently and he received what God had promised. Those of us in America are waiting patiently to receive what God has promised. We are. I mean, what else can we do? We're going to wait patiently. God's still God. And Abraham waited patiently, and he received what God had promised. Verse 18, so God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it's impossible for God to lie. That's why I tell you, find your favorite scripture. Find your favorite scripture. If, I'm, I'm looking real quick. If somebody who texts me on a regular basis that is seeking God, that is, is, is in one of those valleys in, in her life right now, if you're on, and I see that you are, it is the reason I ask you to find your favorite scripture. Find your favorite scripture. Find the promise that God has given you. I point them out every single day. Every single day I point them out as I'm reading. I find the promises for that day that gets me through that day. But it didn't start there. It, it didn't even start with me being able to read the whole Bible all the way through. I, I grabbed a scripture and I hung on to it as I was climbing up out of the pits of hell that I had uh, created for myself. And it was Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, saith the Lord, plans to prosper you, Elizabeth, not to harm you, to give you a future and a hope, to know that God had a good plan for me, even though I had wrecked my life. That's what I clung to. That's what this is saying right here. So God has given both his promise and an oath. But if you haven't read the book, how do you know what the promise is? I, I clung to that rhema word I got at one o'clock in the morning, sitting in my recliner after that phone call came. God promised me he was taking care of my boys. I've clung to that all these years. That was 20 years ago. 
And it's still true for me today. How do you know if you're not praying, if you're not listening, if you're not reading? If you've grown dull, spiritually dull and indifferent, grab the promise that he spoke to you. And Abraham waited patiently and he received what God promised. What is your scripture? What is your scripture to hang on to? So God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence. Great confidence. I have great confidence on November the 4th of 2020 that the best is yet to come because I've got promises that I stand on both from his word and from his spoken word to me. I have promises that I know that the best is. I have that hope. Hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain and into God's inner sanctuary. See, it is written. It's not me just making it up about the outer courtyard and the inner room and the Holy of Holies. <laughs> it says, it's written, it leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. What curtain is he talking about? The veil. The veil actually hung between the inner room and the upper room, the holy room and the most holy room. It was a veil that hung because you could only, only a priest could enter into the Holy of Holies and it was once a year and they tied a, a rope on their foot in case they sinned or had sin in them as they entered into the Holy of Holies. Oh, I want to live in the Holy of Holies. I believe that there has been moments in my life when God took me from my timeline and transported me just as he picked up Ezekiel and moved him and he, and he, brought me to the Holy of Holies and I had that encounter with him and I was enlightened and he brought me back. And this chapter in Hebrews explains that experience if you're there and if you're ready. What a, a chapter we have. This hope is strong and trustworthy. Uh, uh, this hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. Jesus has already gone in there for us. He has become our eternal high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Glory. That's why I highlight the word glory all the way through my Bible. We get to experience, we get to taste and see the glory of the Lord. Oh, mm, it's good stuff. We experienced that at our retreat. We experienced, we had that encounter. We were enlightened at our retreat. It was, it was heavenly. It was glorious. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, Psalms 105, verse 19, until the time came to fulfill his dreams. Dream big. Until the time came to fulfill his dreams, the Lord tested Joseph's character. Just like in verse 15 of Hebrews uh, 6, then Abraham waited patiently and he received what God had promised. So did Joseph wait patiently, oftentimes in prison, for his dreams to be fulfilled. And then we'll end with Proverbs 27 this morning, 1 through 2. <laughs> Don't brag about tomorrow since you don't know what the day will bring. November the 4th of 2020, right now today, we do not know what tomorrow will bring, but we've got God's promises about what tomorrow will be for us. Let someone else praise you, not your own mouth. A stranger, not your own lips. It is not our place to promote ourselves. It is not our place to say, ooh, 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 let me, let me, let me. <laughs> All of our promotions come from God. 
both physically, spiritually, emotionally, in every way, our promotions come from him. Powerful words on this November the 4th on a wonderful, wonderful Wednesday right here in the United States of America. I love this country. For those of you that voted, thank you, thank you, thank you for voting. I love y'all.